My name's Simon Bowler, and I've just built this lean-to oak frame gazebo. Here's how we did it. So this is our blank canvas. This is our start point for this project. The brief from the clients was this. They told me that the sun shines through these patio doors in a fashion that makes it uncomfortably hot on the inside. So they want some shade to protect them from the sun, but they also want to enjoy an outside, inside space, somewhere to sit and eat, somewhere that's undercover. So we're gonna kill two birds with one stone and build an oak frame lean-to gazebo. It's gonna be about three meters in this direction and about four meters in this direction. We're gonna fix an oak post to the wall here, the same over here, and then there's gonna be another oak post in the corner here to support the wall plate. We've got the posts here. Before we start and install it, we've got a footing to dig, but the weather today is absolutely appalling, so we're not gonna do that today. What we are gonna do is go over to where we're working, have a look at the posts, talk about those, and understand what has to happen to them before they come back out here. So we've just taken delivery of our oak beams. We hand choose all our oak beams from the supplier. We choose them for straightness and squareness. We don't choose them based on their color. Notice the ones at the bottom are a completely different color to the ones on the top. That's fine because the first process that we're gonna put them through is to plane them, make them nice and smooth and make them look brand new again. So now we get to session the massive comedy size plane. The beams have been planed, they're now all nice and smooth. We put the gazebo up because there's some kind of storm coming over and my haircut doesn't do well in the wet. Anyway, what we've got to do now is just get the beams on the trestles, roll them around, familiarise ourselves with them and decide where specifically each beam and post is gonna go on the job, and then we can make some moves towards setting them out and cutting the appropriate mortises and tenons in them. So that's what we're gonna do now. Roll our beams around. So we need two to bolt to the wall, to the house, and one freestanding. So the perler wants to be the freestanding one. <laughs> This is a four way. When I say four way, I mean the shape of the tenon. It's going to have shoulders on all four sides of the top of the posts, hence the term four way. This is the post that we've identified as the one that we're going to use for the corner. It's, in our opinion, the prettiest of the three posts that we've got. They're all great pieces of timber because we chose them by hand, but this one, in our opinion, is the prettiest. So this is the one that's going to get seen from all four sides. We've got to put what we call a four-way ten on the end, like I mentioned earlier, shoulders on all four sides of the post. It's a 200 mil post. We're going to aim to leave a third of the material in the post, taking out a third from all four sides. For ease of maths, we're going to make a 65 mil cut all the way around, then swipe it all out at 65 mil deep, smash it off with a hammer, and that will show us our square tenon. All done with the comedy sized handheld circular saw. We need to make sure that this tenon protrudes all the way through the half lap joint in the wall plate. So I'm going to make it 210 millimeters long, which will send it all the way through plus a bit, and we'll trim that off later. If that doesn't make sense now, it will do in the fullness of time. 210 mil. Square sides. Sixty-five mil deep. It's 
it's not plugged in whilst I'm getting my fingers near the blade. It's a bit deep. Saw is set. Time to swipe. So you can see that we've left a third of the material in the middle of the post. That tenon will sit very nicely in a mortise that we're going to cut in the ends of the two wall plates. We'll come to that a little bit later on. So this post is one that's getting bolted to the house. It's got a tenon with three shoulders. That's to accommodate the wall plate. The wall plate is going to sit on top and be coming off in that direction. It's a little bit awkward to explain as we are on the trestles here. All will come apparent. We've got one more of these to do, then we can look at some mortises and we get to play with the chain mortiser, which is always good news. All of the posts are prepped. We have a tenon on the end of each support post, which means we can move on to the knee braces. The knee braces are these things, the curvy bits the quintessential detail on any oak frame. So now we have to cut some mortises in the post. We have to understand where that mortise needs to go. And the process of setting it out is very simple. One tenon fits in the wall plate, one tenon fits in the post. So if you offer it up to the side, you have line of sight down the shoulder of the knee brace, lining up with the shoulder on the post, which tells you exactly where this mortise needs to go. Square it around, measure it up, set it out, dig the mortise, which is the next job. Chain mortiser incoming. Layout is done. Took the measurements directly off the tenon on the knee brace, used a sliding square to make sure everything is nice and central. Now, time to dig a mortise. sawdust and makes me smile every time. Other side now. And then we got interrupted by our client. What I was saying was this machine generates a lot of sawdust and it makes me smile every time I use it. I think we got it that time. <laughs> oh you want me to carry on? Well, I've got the other side to do. If you do it from the other side, it's not a great angle. Huh? If you do it from the other side, it's I not a great angle. I can't do it from the other side, no. Huh? I can't do it from the other side, no. Just... That's what they're saying to your back. Eh? Hey? They're just saying you're back. Well, that's how it is. It's the same thing happening from the other side. Oh, 
I'm making it fit. No. The machine cuts a rounded bottom in the bottom of the mortise, and obviously the edge of this is still square, so I'm just knocking the corners off. It's important that the tenon is shorter than the mortise, so that when the timber shrinks, they don't crash into each other. So it's got to fit. It's got to be slightly too short. It's got to be a snug-ish fit. We're not after a press fit. Similarly, it doesn't want to be baggy. There we are. Lovely job. Repeat that for each knee brace. Posts are prepped, tenons, mortises done. Now we turn our attention to the wall plate, specifically the first joint we're going to cut, which is a half lap with a mortise all the way through it. So best we get another beam on the trestles. So the beam that's on the trestles now is this long one across the front. Four meters long, it's the first wall plate. And when we chose this beam, we realized that it was dead straight in one direction, but did have a slight curve in the other. Most long oak beams aren't perfectly straight. This is no exception. So what we've done is orientated it in the fashion that it's gonna sit on the structure. The dead flat side is on top and our rafters are gonna come down here. The slight curve is in the direction that you're not gonna see it. It's really important to orientate these in such a way as the critical views stay flat. In this instance, that is the roof line, the roof detail. We want a dead flat roof. We're gonna cut a half lap joint in it now and put a mortise through that to form the connection at the corner. So that's that flattened off, ready for a mortise that goes all the way through to accept the tenon on the corner post. If you remember, that was the one, that was the four-way one, the one with shoulders on all four sides. So this is going to receive a mortise all the way through to suit that tenon. The tenon on the end of the corner post is 70 millimeters square. So not surprisingly, the mortise needs to be 70 millimeters square in the middle of the underside of this wall plate going all the way through. So I'm gonna lay that out and then dig it out with the chain mortiser. You can hear the rain. People need to know the conditions that we work in. They probably don't, do they? But anyway, it's raining. Mortise is through, 70 mil square. We also need a mortise for the knee brace in the underside of this wall plate. So that gets set out in a very similar fashion to the mortises that were in the posts. In this instance, we're lining the shoulder of the knee brace up with the shoulder on the underside of the wall plate. Mark it off. set it out and dig it out. Sometimes they're a bit too tight, so you just have to plane it down a bit so it goes in nicely. So that is that corner assembly done, half lapped, mortise, tenoned, the lot. And that is the end of today, which is convenient because it's getting dark. Hopefully, when we come back, 
the weather will be a bit better and we can look at digging that hole and casting that concrete footing. We better get the brush out and start steering that, I think. Today is a new day and the weather has improved dramatically, which is good news. All of the beams are prepped now. And since it stopped raining, I'm going to turn my attention to digging this concrete footing. What we need is a concrete footing underneath the patio to take the compressive force, the weight of the gazebo. And it is as simple as lift up some flags, dig a hole, fill it full of concrete, and put the flags back in. It's a simple process. It's arduous. I'm a bit too old and tired for it, but I'm going to get on with it anyway. Roll time lapse. <laughs> The hole is dug. I do find it more and more physically demanding digging holes as I get well into my late 20s. Anyway, we've dug this about half a metre by about half a metre by about half a metre. All I've got to do now is fill it full of concrete and then put the flags back down before this little chapter done. So now the hole is full of concrete, we can put our flags back down. The concrete is a five to one mix. We're gonna put the flags on a four to one mix. And we're gonna put the flags straight on top of this concrete before the concrete's gone off. So that as everything goes off, it all goes off in one solid lump. That's important. So it's all behaving as one pile of concrete and sand and cement and flags so that it can't sink at all. Now I'm no expert at paving. I do it a little bit here and there, now and again, just to facilitate projects like this. But what I do know is that you've got to have a solid full bed and you've got a slurry at the back of the flags. This is a mixture of SBR and cement and it's really messy but it just means that the flag will actually stick to the sand and cement. You can put this on with a roller. I didn't bring a roller, so I've used the back of a trowel. Flags are back down and the backs recovered. So we have positioned the outer two staddle stones. We've cut the back off those staddle stones, you'll see why. When we put the posts on, it's down to the size of the stone versus the size of the post. And we've also positioned our corner staddle stone directly on the patio, which in turn is on the sand and cement, which in turn is on the concrete, all nice and supported. We've set that out using two string lines, one running down the back of the house and one running down the side of the house and then taking some simple measurements, how far off the bricks, how far off the bricks, and that tells us exactly where that staddle stone goes. And we've been able to take a square measurement just to cross check that as well. So now we can work out exactly the final dimensions in terms of length of our three posts in our two wall plates and get ready to lift it into place. We have bolted the first two posts to the existing structure, the house. So we're gonna lift our wall plates into position now. Some years ago, one of our clients came to us and they said, Simon, can you make an accommodation for us putting an LED strip 
to up like the ceiling. We said, yeah, no problem. What we'll do is we'll wrap to a groove in on top of the wall plate so that you can put a diffused LED strip in. It'll look beautiful up lighting the rafters. One client asked once, but what we do now is we put that groove in the top of the wall plate on every single project. Because really you only get one chance to do it. It will be extremely awkward to do it after the roof is on. So irrespective of whether the client has asked us to put the groove in or not, or if they're gonna have LED strips or not, we always put a 15 mil groove on the top of the wall plate, just in case clients decide to put an LED strip in to up like the ceiling. That makes us a bit unique because we're carpenters looking after electricians and helping them out. So that is a two flute straight cutter in the router. We use the fence to keep it nice and straight, nice and parallel. It's a half inch cordless router. It's an absolute pleasure to use. So that's ready for an LED strip should our clients choose to put one in. So what you've just seen is us having lifted the beams in, strapped all the joints together as tight as we can, drilled them all all the way through and hammered our oak dowels in. So the last chapter, the last thing to do before we move on to the roof is to put our stop chamfer detail in. This could be done before we erect the frame, but for some reason we've fallen into the habit of always doing it after we've erected the frame. That works for us. That's what I'm gonna do now before we move on to the roof. It's time to put the roof on this oak frame gazebo. Let's take a look at what we've done so far and what we're gonna do going forward. Right, first two pieces of timber are already up here and already bolted on, wall plate and the first rafter. The rafters are gonna be C24 eight by two or 200 mil by 50. And we're gonna space those out at 400 mil centers or less. I've done the maths, the gap works out at 331 mil. We like to put quite a bit of timber in. It just gives it that more chunky, robust feel. Each rafter gets two bird's mouths, one over the wall plate at the back and one over the oak beam at the front. So we're gonna fire all these rafters on now and then we're gonna talk a little bit about a detail at the front that we've put in to accommodate an LED lighting strip. So that's half the rafters on couple of notable points. Number one, the bird's mouth over the oak beam at the front has this additional notch in it. That is to facilitate the installation of an LED strip. If you remember, we routed the groove in this beam for an LED strip to uplight the roof. That's just us looking after the electrician. Hopefully we put a smile on the Sparky's face when he comes to install that. We've left plenty of meat on the rafter so that we can fix it down properly. And we've also bird's mouth over the wall plate that's bolted to the house. So it's all nice and strong and load bearing and looking good. I think there's five more rafters to put on, then we can cut the tails off and board it with our twin roof. So what you might have noticed having just watched that time lapse is that we choose to mark each individual rafter according to where it's gonna go on the structure and that's because not all oak beams are straight and if we cut all the rafters based off one pattern the likelihood of them all fitting is very very slim the same applies for cutting the fascia board detail we want a perfectly straight line so we're going to follow a string line i've marked them all up nice and plumb to the right length and now we're going to cut them off with our rear handle saw which is one of my personal favorites Rafters are on, as you've seen. Plum cuts have been made at 
this end of the rafters ready to accept our fascia board. The next job is to clad the top of the rafters with this stuff, which is V-joint tongue and groove. It serves two purposes. First of all, it knits all the rafters together and adds a lot of structural integrity. And second, when you look up, it provides a really nice decorative finish from inside the gazebo. So we've got some nails to shoot now. Let's color the rafters in with tongue and groove. We've had a delivery in this pallet is the roofing material that we're going to be finishing this gazebo with. So let's formally introduce it. The product is called Light Slate and it's manufactured in the UK by a company called Britnet. And there's a number of reasons why we've spec'd it on this job and previous projects as well. The primary reason is that it goes down to very, very low roof angles. The angle on this project is 13 degrees and on a lean to roof, these will go down further, right down to 12 degrees. And as far as I'm aware, there isn't a natural slate product out there that will accommodate roofs that low. The other reason why I like them is because they're a composite slate. They are unbelievably resilient, extremely tough, and an absolute pleasure to work with. Britma also look after us in the sense that they provide a complete system. So we've got the slates in here, of which this is one, but we also need a verge detail. So they supply us with a dry verge detail, and it's this component that's gonna go on the roof next. So let's take a look at this how it gets installed and the purpose that it serves. So as you can see behind me, one or two things have happened which we haven't documented. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, my cameraman hasn't been very well, although he's much better now. He's back behind the camera. And the other reason is yesterday, when we had the camera out, it may or may not have been recording in slow-mo. So unless you want to watch about 10 hours of footage of me in silence talking about the roof, we're going to glaze over it and I'm going to talk to you about it now. So we put the rafters on, we've overboarded the rafters with tongue and groove, we've installed some counter buttons, we've installed some roofing membrane and we've installed some lats onto which we're going to nail the tiles. The counter buttons are there to provide an airspace between the tongue and groove and the membrane and the buttons as I've just said are there to hold the tiles, that's what we're going to nail them down to. So what we're working on now is the barge board detail on the gable end. We fitted the first two courses of fascia board on the front, it's oak tongue and groove. Actually, we made the tongue and groove. We only needed a small batch, so we chose to make it and machine it in a workshop, which we've done a video on previously, if you're interested in how that gets made. But now we're working on the gable end detail, and we're going to look at the verge trim, which I've just shown you on that palette of tiles. So the verge trim is designed in such a way as once it's installed, the tiles fit into that rebate. Just gives a nice finish. And it goes on there, just like that. We're gonna roll our membrane up and over. You've always gotta think about what happens if any water gets through the tiles in the very unlikely event that that happens. Because we've rolled that membrane over, any water would hit the edge of that membrane and make its way down to the gutter. So nothing can leak down the gable. I'm just gonna tack this on with some little tiny stainless steel nails. In time, this will be held on by the barge board, but we'll come to that in a minute. Once I've tacked this on, we'll have a look at the connector piece. So these come in one meter lengths, which obviously isn't long enough. So we've got several sections, but these have to be jointed. Wouldn't really work just buttoning it up and having an unsealed gap. So Britmet, in their wisdom, have designed these verge connector pieces. And they just slot on. Put 
push it up tight. There's a little tab there that you fold over just to allow it to go all the way home. You'll know it's gone home because it stops moving. And then next piece. So we'll tack that on. And then repeat that process all the way to the end. The last one will have to be cut to suit. But I think you'll agree that is a very neat, slick solution. It means you don't see any sides of any tiles, keeps it all nice and watertight. Good old BritMet. So you can see what I was talking about earlier about the barge board covering that return detail on the verge trim. This is tongue and groove. Like I said, we made this, it slots together. We've left a little expansion gap and we're face fixing it with stainless steel screws. We've marked them all out. You're gonna see the screws, so we've been very careful to mark them all in a perfectly straight line, so it's all neat and tidy. They just need drilling out and screwing in. So now we get to move on to the tiles, which is good news. We're gonna look at each detail, each part of the process of putting these tiles on. So you notice we've got two lats at the bottom. That is to accommodate the first course, the under course, which is a cut down tile. In terms of cutting these, we just use regular joinery wood cutting tools. These get cut on the chop saw. So this under course gets nailed straight through the face into this lower lat all the way along. We've done some setting out. We know that we needed to start with a full tile and that presents as a sensible cut at the far end. So I'm gonna lay all these out, nail them down, and then we'll look at the next course, which is a full tile. In terms of fixings, unlike natural slate, these get fixed down with a 30 mil galvanized steel nail. Because they're so tough, you wouldn't be able to hammer a copper nail through, it would just bend. So the manufacturer's recommendations is a galvanized nail. So we've got a few of these to, to knock on, and then we'll look at the next course. Second course then, which goes over the top of the first course, not surprisingly, goes flush with the bottom of the undercourse, and interestingly, is spaced out by exactly that amount. The light slates have a little spacer tab on each one, so you can't really miss in terms of their spacing. These get nailed straight through into the top lat of that pair that you saw me point out earlier. Straight through the tile, straight through the tile below it and into that lat. Easy. Right, Mr. Cameraman, are you gonna explain why we're cutting straight to a point where all the tiles are done, or am I going to explain? I think I'll explain. So, for two days I've been without a cameraman, and it's very, very challenging to generate any footage of any worth when you're on your own, particularly given that I have absolutely no idea how to steer the camera. It's very complicated and far beyond what my little pea brain can keep up with. Anyway, like I've said, all the tiles are on, and the lead work is on as well, all oiled up and sealed in and done. I'm not gonna to dwell too much on the lead work on this project, that may well be a future video. But the roof is now done, and the only thing that's left to do is fit the guttering. There's one other little detail that we'll take a quick look at before we do that, and that's some work that I did on the gable end at the request of our clients, just to add a bit of detail, so we'll go and have a look at that now. So when I was going through the design process, talking to the clients about it, they said, Simon, can you introduce something on the gable end that just breaks it up, that joins the roof to the wall plate at the side? And at the, on the drawing, I'd drawn just a few sporadic pieces of oak to do exactly that, just to join the wall plate. 
to the roof. But when I came to put this in yesterday, I decided to put a lot more slats in, make it much more, much more densely populated for the benefit of the overall aesthetic. And I think it's worked very well. All I did was extend the barge board down, fasten an oak batten to the top of the wall plate, fix the slats straight through the face with stainless steel screws into that batten, and then fix them at the back into the barge board from behind so you can't see. And I think it's achieved exactly what I wanted to do. And I enjoy having the freedom to kind of do what I think is going to look best. I think it's worked very well. Guttering is on, it matches what's on the main house. So that means we can call this project completely finished. I wonder what the next video is gonna be about. Maybe I'll see you there, bye for now.